Okay. Well, I think we're at the top of the hour right now, and I hope most people have had a chance to sign in. And I would like to welcome everyone who signed up today to participate. We have our session of the Open Library Community Forum on the GoKB update. And we're lucky to have uh, Kristen Wilson and Jennifer Solomon with us today to talk about the global open knowledge base, the uh, GoKB. And we're going to be talking about data enhancement strategies and new services in GoKB, which is very exciting. So I am Sharon Wiles Young, Director of Library Access Services at Lehigh University, and one of Lehigh is one of the OLA implementers and a partner in the GoKB service. And I will serve as your facilitator today. Of course, this forum will be recorded and every participant will receive a link to the recording and the recording will also be available on the openlibraryenvironment.org website. We encourage everybody to ask questions today and use the QA box on the WebEx screen um, and I'll be asking questions at the end, but if there is a relevant question that comes up or if you have a burning question that comes up while Kristen or Jennifer are speaking, please put it in the Q&A box and we will try to get that question in at the time of um, uh, their discussion. So we do have an hour and a half today, so I hope we can address most questions, so we encourage you to ask. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce um, our two dedicated speakers today, our experts on the GoKB project. We have Kristen Wilson, who is Associate Head of Acquisitions and Discovery at the North Carolina State University Libraries. She manages the department's serials unit and has been involved in the development of a local electronic resource management system and the global open knowledge base GoKB. She has published on the topics of knowledge bases, electronic resources management, and workflow analysis in journals such as Serials Review and the Library Resources and Technology technical services. She holds a BA in English and Journalism from Lehigh and an MSLS uh, from Syracuse University. Jennifer Solomon is the GoKB editor and part of the Acquisition and Discovery Department at the North Carolina State University Libraries. She has primary responsibility for coordinating GoKB's data collection and ingest process, leading volunteer training and collaborating with project partners. Jennifer has a diverse background in project management, librarianship, and communications. She holds an MSLS from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and an MFA in creative writing from Indiana University. Welcome, and I will turn this right over to Kristen and Jennifer. Thanks, Sharon. Can you hear me all right? Yes, I can hear you. Great, thank you. Um, and thanks for the great introductions, and thanks to everybody who um, is here today to hear a little bit about the Global Open Knowledge Base Project and what we're doing. Um, in addition to uh, what Sharon shared, I just wanted to let everyone know kind of um, my role with the project and Jennifer's. Um, I have been involved with the project pretty much since its start, um, and it, the project did originate at NC State. And for the past two years, I was the PI for the Mellon grant that we had to fund GoKB. So I've really been kind of a de facto project manager for GoKB, kind of having a hand in almost everything that we've done related to the project, uh, along with our steering committee and other participants. And then Jennifer, as the GoKB editor, really does a lot of the day-to-day -day operational support for managing data and managing our volunteer communities. And she'll talk a little bit more about that specifically when uh, she talks about those topics. Oh, 
There we go. Um, so just to give a quick overview of what we'll be talking about today, I'm going to start off with a, a general introduction to the GoKB project, sort of what is GoKB, what's the purpose of the project, what have we done so far, and I know uh, some of you may be familiar with this, but there are a lot of new uh, participants in this webinar who haven't necessarily been involved with GoKB before, so I want to make sure everyone's kind of starting with the basics. Then Jennifer is going to take over and she's going to do a demo of the current GoKB knowledge base and show some of the data that's in there and some of the features of the knowledge base that are particularly interesting. And she'll also talk a little bit about our current data strategy. So how are we working with um, our current volunteer partners and our current um, resources to maintain uh, the data that we are in GoKB right now. And then I want to spend uh, probably the most time talking a little bit about what's next for GoKB because I think we're at kind of a pivotal moment for the project where we finished our current round of grant funding. We're thinking about what to do next um, with our intersection um, with the Olay project. And so I think we have some really interesting ideas that are a little bit of a shift in focus for GoKB and I'd be really curious to hear what uh, the people on this webinar think about those ideas, hear your suggestions. So I'm hoping that during the Q&A we can talk a little bit about that and a little bit about ways that GoKB can be most useful to the community. So I'll start off talking a little bit about what is GoKB. Um, and I'm guessing in this crowd, uh, most of us are probably familiar with e-resource knowledge bases, like the ones that are provided by Serial Solutions or OCLC or Ex Libris or EBSCO. And so um, at its heart, GoKB really is similar to those projects. It's an effort to build um, kind of an open version of those knowledge bases. So um, it's, it's data or metadata about electronic resources, and that includes things like packages of electronic resources that are sold by publishers to the academic market, uh, the titles that are in those packages, metadata describing things like titles, organizations, platforms, all the elements that go into making e-resources available, and then holdings information as well. So if you buy a particular title as part of a particular package, the URL you would need to access that content, the coverage dates that you would get access to if you made that purchase. And this is all at a global level. So it's kind of the default things that are out there in the market for people to buy, and it's kind of the default, this is what you would get as a rule if you bought this package. And of course, local data can vary from that global version of the data, but really we're focused on the global. Uh, in addition to being an e-resource knowledge base, GoKB is also, um, has tried to make an effort to enhance the type of data that's found in a knowledge base. So um, a lot of uh, current knowledge bases really have traditionally been kind of a snapshot. So uh, what is available right now? And so one of the areas where we really tried to focus with GoKB is trying to capture a little bit more of changes over time. So GoKB has some functionality to do things like track title changes, pull together title families, track all the different publishers who have published a title over its lifespan, uh, pull those together. So giving kind of some views of the bibliographic side of things, but also we can do some status tracking for um, more of the holding side of things as well. So when you're thinking about what titles are in a package, uh, we can use statuses to show here's what's in the package right now, but here is what used to be in the package. And here are things that are going to be in the package maybe next year, but they're not there yet. So we can do a little bit more of um, kind of a more faceted view of this data. The other way that we've been trying to enhance our data, and this ties into kind of the community approach, is also offering more transparency. So being able to show who is the last person that edited something, when was it last edited, um, has, does it have a kind of an approved status. Uh, there's also kind of a curator function so people can say, my organization is taking responsibility for this data. So kind of exposing who's doing what um, and when in the knowledge base. 
GoKB is also open data, and so that has been part of our mission from the beginning, is to take this knowledge base data and kind of make it more open than it's been. So all of the data that is in GoKB is offered under a CC0 license, which means it can be used by anyone for any purpose without attribution. And so what we really want is to just make this data as widely available as possible. Anyone can do what they want with it. They don't have to ask permission. They don't have to do anything special to use it. Uh, and then finally, GoKB is community managed data. So um, our original uh, model for the project, and this is maybe some good background to have anyway, is that uh, GoKB originally started off as a sister project to Kowalio Lay. And GoKB kind of had two, two different major goals. One was to be a knowledge base for the Kualia Lay system, and then the other one was to solve data problems throughout the supply chain. Um, and so the idea was that the Olay partners and implementers would be the community who managed the data in GoKB, essentially creating and providing a knowledge base for the system that they were using and kind of sharing that load across implementers. Um, and with Olay kind of changing directions now, uh, that part of our mission has sort of fallen away a little bit. Um, I mean, GoKB is still available out there to be a knowledge base for someone if they would like to use it in that context. And I'll talk a little bit about that too. Um, but we're really now kind of shifting our focus a little bit more into these supply chain issues. And that means we've really been focusing on expanding our community. And we have a lot of volunteer data managers from many different institutions who are not associated with Olay, but who have heard about this project at conferences and are interested in our mission. They see it as service to the profession. And so they've been contributing data to GoKB. Um, you know, just sort of as a professional activity. Uh, and so we want to keep growing that community so that we can, we can gain capacity to manage more types of data. Um, but, you know, we have done uh, quite a bit with the resources we have, and Jennifer will um, kind of talk more specifically about, you know, exactly what our community looks like right, right now, what our data looks like, and her demo will uh, display a lot of the features that I've mentioned, so you'll actually get to see those in the live system. So uh, why GoKB? You know, what uh, is sort of the value proposition that we see behind this project? And I have a quote here that I use a lot, and I love this one a lot, uh, it's from an article written by Ross Singer about the idea of community-managed knowledge bases. And this goes back to 2008, so this is really not a new idea. And if anybody remembers the Jake project, I mean, that basically came out like right around the same time as first knowledge bases. So the idea that a kind of a community-driven knowledge base um, could be really useful, I think, has been around for a long time. And I think Ross Singer hits on kind of the two main points or the two main value propositions in this quote. You know, one is sustainability. So he talks about how you can tap into the power of the community, so kind of a crowdsourcing effort. You know, all of us work with knowledge bases already. We spend a lot of time cleaning up e-resource metadata. And if we could contribute that to a central open environment, that data could actually you know, to benefit the entire community in a way that it oftentimes doesn't right now. And then the other one is um, innovation. So the idea that if the knowledge base is out there and it involves the entire community, it's data that anyone can use, people are going to start to use that data and innovate with it. And so um, I think those are kind of the two benefits that we really see to the GoKB project. And so to talk a little bit more specifically about this mission of solving problems across the supply chain, I think there's a few specific pro problems uh, that GoKB is really right now focusing on addressing and would like to address in the future. Uh, so one of these is duplication of effort. Um, uh, so talking a little bit about the different knowledge bases that are out there, you know, there's several vendors who all manage knowledge bases. And having worked on this project for several years now, I've learned a lot about the effort that it takes to manage a knowledge base. And it's an enormous amount of effort. There are so many resources out there. Um, it really takes kind of a small army to do this. And there's several different organizations, vendors who are out there doing this work, essentially trying to get the same data, clean up the same data, 
solve the same problems and make the same data available. So everyone's kind of doing the same thing with the same data, just slightly differently. And so there really is a lot of duplication of effort that if somehow a way could be found to share even small parts of those efforts in a central way, I think that could really help um, improve data quality and really help also with some consistency across different knowledge bases as well. Uh, data quality issues are, of course, um, always a classic when it comes to knowledge bases. People have been writing about these and presenting about them pretty much since the beginning. Uh, but there's so many different packages of journals. It can be really difficult to keep track of what's in a given package on any given day. Titles come and go. They change. They get sold to different publishers. And so um, keeping track of all that, as well as just bibliographic data, you know, making sure that titles have the right ISSNs, um, the right publishers, the right, the right metadata. And so I think with GoKB, we're hoping that we can use the efforts of the community who are really good at solving these data quality issues to help create a knowledge base where um, a lot of these, you know, there's a mechanism for people to have a direct impact in fixing these data quality issues. And finally, untangling data and software. So the real model for knowledge bases up till this point has always been that a knowledge base is very much tied in with particular vendor software. Uh, for the most part, most commercial knowledge bases aren't even a product that you can just buy on your own. So they always sort of come with something else, whether it's a link resolver, or a discovery service, or an ERM, or a library services platform. And so one of the things about GoKB that is both, I think, good, but also can be kind of tricky to explain sometimes, is that GoKB is really a pure data project. It's an effort to create knowledge base data and make that data available. Um, and it's not an attempt to create services that use that data. So GoKB is not creating a link resolver or a MARC record service or an ERM or anything like that. Um, but one of the things about GoKB is that um, it can actually be used with other services even if um, GoKB itself is not providing those services. So the open nature of the data means that anyone can sort of take this knowledge base, consume the data, and use it with their services. And we actually are currently um, been talking and working with a few different projects who are really interested in basically repurposing GoKB's knowledge base for use with their software. But on the GoKB side of things, we're really worrying about the data, and then that data can go and be used anywhere. So it kind of makes the data a little bit more modular, and I think that's a concept that has, um, we kind of want to run with, too, when we think about what we're going to do in the future. And so um, one of the things about GoKB that I think does resonate with people, and this goes back to a lot of the points that I was making about duplication of effort, is that it's also really an attempt to get people to contribute effort at the right level. So everyone has to manage their local data, but when it comes to national consortial data or global data, it just doesn't make sense for lots of different libraries, lots of different knowledge bases to be managing this data independently. So I think the project is really about kind of taking all the people who are already doing work on global, national, or consortial information and sort of combining their efforts and putting it out there in a central location where then everyone can consume it. And then to wrap up uh, this overview, I'll just give a little bit of kind of project history just so people have a sense of where we've been and where we are now with the GoKV project. So phase one for the project began in 2012, and it started as a joint uh, proposal for funding between Kowali Olay and JISC. So Olay was interested in creating a knowledge base for the Olay service, and JISC was interested in creating a knowledge base for their KB Plus service. And so we worked together on a data model on the funding proposal, which was funded by Mellon in 2012. And that first phase really resulted in uh, finalizing the data model for the knowledge base, working on a workflow and tools for data loading. So we do use OpenRefine to uh, pull in data, normalize it, and then load it into the knowledge base. And this phase was really focused on e-journals, so modeling the data for e-journals and getting the loading process down for those. 
uh, in 2014, we were, uh, received our second Mellon grant for phase two funding. And during this phase, um, our focuses were a little different. So we really started to focus in on community growth. That was when we were able to hire Jennifer as the GoKB editor, which was uh, hugely beneficial to that area. She's been able to really work with people who are interested in the project. Uh, we also brought in ebooks into our data model. And uh, as we're finishing up phase two, I mean, it's essentially finished and we now have the capacity to ingest ebook data into the knowledge base. We need to start really piloting the workflows uh, to actually make that happen. And then we've also been working on exposing GoKB's data as linked data. And we do have a Sparkle endpoint for GoKB where people can use Sparkle to query the data that's in the knowledge base that way as well. So kind of another avenue for people to get the data. Um, and I should mention the other ways are um, just sort of viewing it online and then downloading spreadsheets and there's also an API. So there's a lot of ways to get the data. And we finished up our phase two funding this past spring. So right now we're in a place where we're really thinking about what is the next phase for GoKB. And uh, one good thing is that we know that we are secure in terms of maintenance. So GoKB has always been associated with the open library environment and a sister project to Olay. And so with the end of our separate funding from Mellon, we're kind of joining up more officially with uh, the open library environment, and they are going to be providing us with ongoing funding for the GoKB editor position, the uh, hosting and server space for the knowledge base, and ongoing technical support. Uh, but we've also found out from them that it sounds like going forward, there's a really strong possibility that we may be able to get some additional funding for new development as well. So we're starting to think about what do we want to do with this opportunity uh, to really get this project or to keep this project going in the right direction and make the biggest impact. Uh, so that's what I'm going to be talking about at the end is some ways that we're thinking we can take what's been successful about GoKB and um, kind of move forward with that. Uh, but before I get too far into that, I think it'll really help crystallize um, what I've been talking about for everyone to see the knowledge base and hear a little bit about our data management efforts. So I'm going to uh, pass things over to Jennifer and she can talk with you about that. Um, well, thank you, Sharon and Kristen, for getting us started. Um, and I'm going to, can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to start with a quick demonstration for the GoKD web application. I'm really excited that we have so many of our volunteer data managers here, but I know there's also a lot of people who are brand new to GoKB and its functionality. So I'm going to go over our packages, titles, organizations, and our co-reference service, just so you can understand a little bit more about how this operates um, in reality. And then I will also continue on talking about our community management strategy. Okay. <clears throat> um, we have a great new website at gokb.org, and from there you can log directly into the GoKB web application. And I'm right here on logged in to the dashboard. Um, anyone can register for a view account. So if you go to um, gokb.openlibraryfoundation.org, you can register and you can, um, you know, go and look at any of the data yourself as well as export any of the package files, and I'll show you how to do that. On the left-hand menu, just to orient you, um, is the search function. We have a global search that allows you to type in any sort of topic and it will search all of the different areas, including packages, titles, and organizations. 
We also have a create function for administrators and editors, and that's where you would do a little bit more of the editing function. And then we have an area for review tasks for post-ingest data, and then a few other components, um, such as the co-reference service and the administrative panel. But I'm gonna focus on um, what a typical user would do in GoPayView's web application. So in the packages, we have about 400 packages that we're maintaining, and these are from um, <clears throat> pretty typical research library packages from publishers and providers that a number of university libraries would be likely to subscribe to. Um, this is going to be kind of our ongoing strategy for maintaining our packages. Um, we're probably not going to expand hugely, but because we want to focus on the data quality aspect of our packages and title level data. So just going into one of our packages, um, the American Chemical Society Journals, um, you'll see a familiar package name, the provider, and then the source, which is where we've sourced this particular package that was loaded. Um, for each project um, that we load through, and I'll just back up for just a second, um, we actually load our packages through an, um, a tool called OpenRefine, and that allows us to harmonize the data with the KB column headings and clean up the data before we ingest it. And that I'll talk a little bit more about with our community managers. But this project identifies how and when it was loaded into the web application. The list verifier, as Kristen mentioned, we want to make sure that it's transparent who was verifying the data and when, so a date. Um, the last update method gives an automated information about this, and then the approved status. So we know that this has been reviewed by a data manager, um, that it is quality data, that it's not just plunked into the knowledge base. And then going back up to the top, um, anyone can export the title list from the package as a KBART file. Um, or as a GoKB file. And the slight distinction between these is that the KBART file includes all of the KBART two column headings. And the GoKB has all of the KBART headings plus a little bit more. So if a provider includes additional identifiers or title history notes or subject headings or any other metadata, we do ingest that. So even um, pieces of data that we don't have a standard data field, we will come up in the file. So this could be very useful for integrating with your systems locally um, or to enhance your own data sets that you already have and work. Um, Kristen also mentioned we have a curatory group function. So this notes that North Carolina State University Libraries is the curatory group for this package. And so anyone who has editing status in GoKB would be able to make changes to this, but it's known that someone else is managing this package and you might want to check with them before doing something drastic or deleting it or doing something that would cause a lot of confusion. So in addition to ingesting the package data and the title list, um, we have a part of the review and data enhancement is to go in and complete additional um, data about the package. So the scope, the list status, um, you know, telling about more information about this package than just comes from um, an exported file from the publisher site. And again, down at the bottom, just a little bit more information about the date this was created and who's updated it. Within each package, we have the list of titles, and this displays um, the tip, which I'll talk just a little bit more about, the title, of course, and the status. So um, this would be current or retired or expected. Um, if it was a retired title, that would indicate that, of course, this used to be part of the package, but is no longer. 
Um, the TIP is a really important component of Bouquet B. Uh, so this stands for the Title Instance Package Platform. And Title Instance is interchangeable with Title, but it indicates that this is this title in this particular package from this platform. So while titles are consistent across the knowledge base, the TIP is always unique. Um, <clears throat> so moving into a title, so in a title record, <clears throat> Again, we have, of course, the title, the status, which depending on the status of the title could also vary. This is a current title. Um, this has been approved. So what that means is that one of our data managers has completed a title history review and added additional data. So beyond what's ingested from the package level, um, we have a really great uh, title history project with our data managers where they go in and research the title histories, um, add titles that were before and after, and publication dates. Um, the latest publisher is the current publisher, and the imprint um, we can see is also added here as well. So we try to include imprints whenever possible if that is part of the title. Um, in the published from and published to dates are part of the data enhancement that our data managers do. So I'm going to come back and talk about that a little bit later. But the basic components when you ingest the title list with the package would include the identifiers, um, <clears throat> the publisher, and the availability. So this indicates, again, which packages this title exists in and the coverage date. In the title history section, <clears throat> we can see that we have a title history event indicating that Physica in 1975 split into Physica A and Physica B plus B. And this is a big part of our volunteers' work, is um, doing the research and adding this information. Um, we have a nice way of adding title histories to the knowledge base. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Just briefly demonstrate how we would do this. So if I knew that there was an additional title that was going to occur, Physica is the before title, Physica B condensed matter would be the later title. And then I would choose the correct event date after researching this on the publisher's site or other open sources. Um, and just as an example, I could add that title history. So this shows the relationships between the titles um, by linking them to their later titles or their earlier titles. So this is really where we're adding a lot more um, enhanced data to what would be a typical um, title list. And then I want to also show you some of our organizations. <clears throat> In GoKB, organization is typically the um, so an example is the American Psychological Association. <clears throat> this has been created to include additional information such as um, alternate names. So if 
the we want to use the um, authorized name for all of the publishers throughout GoKB. So if American Psychological Association is our publisher's name, we would want to include alternate names um, and then uh, harmonize them so that they are reflective of the authorized version. This also allows you to search the knowledge base based on these organization names and then come up with the correct one. <clears throat> the roles um, indicate what the organization can do, um, and that could be the content provider, the platform provider, the publisher, or the vendor. And so in um, ingesting data from OpenRefine specifically, what that is required that we include <clears throat> um, the platform as well as identifiers. So uh, organizations can operate on different roles. So while the APA could be a publisher, it might also, for a number of packages, be the platform provider. And then the last thing I want to show you is our co-reference service. So this allows you to search either by name or identifier and return um, all of the related identifiers. <clears throat> so if I do a quick search, <clears throat> for the Acta Archaeologica <clears throat> that will return the external identifiers, including the ISSN, the EISSN, and the DOI. So if there were um, titles that you were looking for or other identifiers, um, this would be a good way of searching that. Um, and, oh, last but not least, we have a review section, so this is really important for our data managers and as we ingest data from OpenRefine. We, part of our workflow includes a data review. And what this does is even though we clean up a lot of the data in Refine before we ingest, the web application still has a number of flags to indicate um, that there might be a conflict. So see if we can get to the data review page, and I'll show you some examples of the review tasks. Well, that's loading. I will take us back to, um, so that gives you an overview of the <clears throat> web application, and I'll show you the review tasks again once that's loaded later on. Um, but I do want to move into talking about our community management strategy, and Kristen mentioned this a little bit as she was talking, um, that we're really focused on data enhancement, and that's where we've been, I think, most successful so far <clears throat> is that we have a really good community and that has continued to grow, especially in the last year or so, of volunteers. Um, we have partners at both um, OLE-affiliated university libraries um, and many other libraries that are just volunteers that have heard about us through um, conference presentations or articles that they've read, and I, um, you know, if you are interested after this presentation, please get in touch with us and we can, um, you know, you can also be involved in some of our data management projects. So as I said, our um, volunteer data managers do our title histories. Um, these are managed, um, you know, a few hours a week and it involves researching the title, um, which are assigned. We, I coordinate the assignments for all of our volunteers. 
Um, so researching the title within the knowledge base, then researching it on the publisher's site and other open sources to make sure that if there is a previous title that that is included um, and then including the publication date. And whenever possible, the publisher changes as well. Um, that really helps to enhance the data in the knowledge base and also makes this essentially available in a way that um, title history and publisher changes are not easy to find. Um, and so again, if this is a place where lots of librarians are doing this work repetitively with GoKD, that could be a central location where that work does not have to be so redundant. Um, it can be a place where a lot of people are working and a lot of people can benefit from it. <clears throat> um, our package management strategy has evolved over the time that I've been with the project, and we are going to be maintaining about 400 packages, as I mentioned. <clears throat> um, what this involves for our volunteer data managers is to go to a publisher site or FTP site and load the um, the packages through OpenRefine. And we're working on a more straightforward bulk data uploader. But right now, what we've been doing is using OpenRefine with a number of macros and a direct ingest to GoKB. So this has involved a little training um, for our volunteers, but they've been very successful at loading and uh, cleaning up the data before the ingest process is complete, and then completing that through reviewing the package information and then completing the data review task. <clears throat> so as I was going to show you a minute ago, we have um, in the request for review, the web application after the data has been ingested into GoKB, it will flag things that it thinks might be a problem either for the package or for the title. And there are a few um, different causes of this. So for example, this tip was not present when ingesting a package. Please check to see if it should be deleted. So this is asking that we um, look to see if the publisher drops a title from the package or if it's just missing. So there's a little bit of investigation involved in resolving these. And what we have been doing is um, assigning the review task to our volunteers as well so that they can work on these a few hours a month. Um, and this has been hugely beneficial because it's, you know, none of the tasks themselves are difficult, but they are a little time consuming for one person to do hundreds of them. So it's really effective for, you know, to just first them in a way that people can do them on a background project scale, one or two hours a week or when they have time. <clears throat> so this will also flag issues with um, print or online ISSNs if they are the same. It will ask to check which is the correct one. It will flag an issue if there's a new publisher that's not been presented on that title before. Um, so it's a good way of cross-checking to make sure that the data ingested really is what we want in the package. So that gives you a good overview of <clears throat> The, um, <clears throat> the web application, how to access the web application, and some of our community management strategies for our data enhancement work. So just to speak briefly about the volunteer opportunities, um, we do have volunteers doing title histories. Um, we have volunteers doing the review tasks. And in the fall, we're going to be doing additional training on data loading and package management. So if any of those things are interesting to you and you have a few hours a month that you can uh, contribute to GoKB, I would be glad to talk to you offline about that as well. And I'm going to pass this back to Kristen. That's great, Jennifer. Um, we had some questions come in while you were giving your great overview there. Um, 
when uh, journal information is updated in, in GoKB, how does it get disseminated to en entities or organizations outside of GoKB? So again, this is where Kristen was mentioning that, you know, as a pure data project, it's not, um, you can watch a package and you can download it. You can use our API and all you have to do for that is write to Kristen or me for permission. Um, <clears throat> so it would be disseminated directly if you have, if you access the API or um, you can download it from the package file itself. So you could use those tools to, because it's open data and get into um, the GoKB data and pull it, right? Is that what yes, you're... exactly. So, and yeah. again, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, um, I think uh, we've, oh, we've sort of been working with the assumption that the API would be the primary means of disseminating changes. And just to give a little detail about how the API works um, right now, you can basically use it to either get a full extract of the knowledge base, or you can use it to get um, a, a file of all changes since a certain date. And so if you were using the model of being an external system that's consuming this data, what you'd probably do is start off by getting um, the, you'd start off by getting the initial data dump from GoKB and then either nightly or weekly or whatever worked for you, getting the change files and working with those. Um, one thing that I do think there could be interest in, and this will probably come up in some of the future direction ideas as well, is like, just some kind of more basic alerting service, like if you wanted to know when title changes happened or when uh, publisher changes happened or something like that, you know, just being able to flag a title and say, send me an email whenever this changes. And we have piloted that a little bit with the eBooks work that we've done, and that should be rolled out into the live system in our next release. Um, and But I could see extending that to journals as well. Great. Thank you. Uh, how does uh, NCSU, for example, use GoKB in its regular technical services workflow? So this is a, a question we get a lot in various forms. Probably the most common form is um, how many people have implemented GoKB? And it's kind of a hard question to answer because, um, you know, there's not necessarily like a, a way you implement it like you do a normal knowledge base. And so uh, it's hard to say how many people are using the data. For us personally, to be perfectly honest, um, we're not really using GoKB in our regular workflows in any kind of really core way uh, as of yet. Because I think the service is still, um, you know, it's taken a while to get to the point where there's a critical mass of useful data, and we may still be getting to that point. Um, I think, you know, people can use it just as a simple lookup tool, and we have discussed the possibility of doing something more sophisticated. So one example is that we have a local ERM called eMatrix that we develop in-house, and so we have been thinking about using GoKB as a source of some metadata about organizations, because currently we have other sources of that data that are not really working for us, and GoKB would probably be a cleaner and more reliable source. So that's the type of way I can envision us pulling GoKB a little bit more into our regular workflows, although that hasn't happened yet. Uh, one other question. Has GoKB been successfully implemented in concordance with an article chapter level index? No, it has not. Um, that's something that I think we would be interested in if somebody else was doing work with that article or chapter data and they needed a good source of like title data. I could see GoKB being a really good fit with that type of project, but we haven't done anything like that up to this point. And Jennifer, I noticed when you were doing the enhancement of the titles and the title history, which is so powerful to have that data in, in a database, to have that title history, um, it, where would it uh, update if the publisher moves? Does that just go into a different package or how does that get 
um, I saw the title and the title history, and I just wondered where you put a publisher change. Oh, um, Kristen, I'm going to take the presenter back. Yeah, or, I you... think I might have to give it to you. Okay. So that's a good question, Sharon. <clears throat> if you bear with me while the you switch over. <clears throat> So there's actually a publisher's tab, and I didn't go into this very much before, but there's a way to add a publisher. So if you knew that um, – this is just a, an example off the top of my head. Yeah. Jennifer, um, I'm not seeing your screen. Oh, I'm sorry. I should not finish there you go. There we go. <laughs> sorry about that. <clears throat> So in a title record, <clears throat> you'll see the latest publisher, and that is the one that we – has come in from the package or we know has – is the most up-to-date publisher. So if – you'll see the publisher date from – and that defaults to the date that was either the ingest date or the date that you added the publisher. But um, – if we imagine that I've reviewed this and I know that the publisher started in 2000 and then ended in 2016. Um, and then there's a new publisher. So this journal comes along and it will update both in the latest publisher field as the new publisher and then in the publisher's tab, <clears throat> it will give it the date that it changed. So this is um, a little bit of a tricky workflow, which is why um, it would be great to have more of these already done um, and something that I, I'm glad that our volunteers are working on. <clears throat> But it does involve a lot of manual work of both reviewing the title history and the publisher changes and then ensuring that it's properly added to GoKB since there is not an automated way to do that. Um, but it will change the latest publisher up here. And there's a couple other functions that allow you to do this as a bulk. Um, so, for example, if a whole package did change, from one publisher to another, we do have an automated way of changing the whole package, um, as well as through the ingest process. Does that answer your question? Yes, that's great. Thank you for okay. showing that. Super. Yeah, yeah that no really problem. helped to see that visual there. Um, also, uh, what? Oh, I just got another question here. What is uh, the project's plan to attract more contributors? Um, that in terms be a of volunteers, segue. oh, yeah, yeah, I was gonna say that sounds like a really good segue into the next. So we have one more, a little bit more um, presentation to finish up, sort of talking about our new, you know, what are we gonna do next? And I think um, that will address some of the questions about getting more contributors as well. Let me just pull my slides back up. So um, I'll talk a little bit about what's next for GoKB. Uh, I'll try to uh, keep this fairly condensed so that we do have some more time for questions if we need it. Um, but as I mentioned before, um, you know, we are looking at the prospect of having some more resources for development, and we've been thinking about, you know, what do we want to do with this project? And so uh, one thing that I did want to share a little bit is that we've done some reflection on what's worked with the project and on what hasn't worked, and I think that's informed our thinking a lot. Um, so in terms of what has worked, um, I think actually Jennifer's comments really give a lot of insight into this. Um, and uh, the example that she talked about with getting people to work on researching and documenting publication changes, so uh, publication dates, title changes, publisher changes, is a great example of something that worked. Uh, and it's actually kind of even 
funny to me in a way because when I, this was before Jennifer started, I was sort of piloting this idea with a few people at NC State and I was like, you know, I'm just going to give you a big list of titles and if you have some time, can you test out this system and work on documenting this information and, you know, no deadlines, it's not a rush, just kind of try it out. And people did so well on this work. I mean, they went, they did a huge volume, like way more than I expected them to do. They said that they enjoyed doing this work um, and they, they wanted to keep doing it. So I was really surprised but pleased by how uh, successful that was. And I think the reason that was successful is it was a very focused effort on one certain type of data. It's easy for people to conceptualize what they were doing to see the results of what they were working on. Um, it's sort of like bite-sized work, so it's really easy to sit down if you have 20 minutes and work through a few titles. You, it's not a really long, complex process where if you don't do it every day and you don't do it all at once, you're going to forget what you're doing. It's very easy to sort of do as you have time. <clears throat> And then it taps into what people are good at too. You know, we have a lot of staff at NC State who are, <clears throat> excuse me, who are uh, serials catalogers, have been doing this kind of work for a long time. And in a lot of cases, they don't actually get to do this work the way they used to because we have outsourced and automated so many of our cataloging processes. So it was a way for people to sort of use skills that they had and really do something concrete with them. So I think those are the areas where GoKB has really shined. Um, in terms of challenges, we certainly have had a lot uh, of challenges with this project that I think we are really aware of. One has been achieving scale. Um, you know, Jennifer mentioned right now we're actively managing about 400 packages um, and we may be able to increase that a little bit as we get uh, more contributors. But right now, it's really hard to do more than that, given that each process has to be, um, or each package has to be ingested through refine, reviewed, made sure everything is normalized. Um, this is something that really takes a lot of effort. And I think for a volunteer project that's still kind of getting a foothold in the community, there's just no way we can achieve the scale of uh, a comprehensive knowledge base that might be run by a vendor with a lot more funds and people than we have. So that's been difficult. Um, complex coordinated efforts, this is kind of the flip side of the bite-sized work, you know, things where it really takes um, a long time, involves a lot of training, um, a lot of understanding of, you know, rules and data processes were also uh, more difficult to implement because I think these are the kinds of things where it's more successful if people are doing that work as kind of a real job, they're doing it every day, they're really immersed in it, and it was harder to, for people to sort of dip in and out of those efforts. And then I think a, another challenge for us was a perception that we were competing with established knowledge bases, that we wanted to sort of replace these other knowledge bases. And I think that um, one, I don't think that's ever really what we were intending to do. I mean, we're really intending to be more of a service that is helping the whole community, including other knowledge bases. And also, I think we can't compete with these other knowledge bases. I think we don't have the scale and the manpower right now to do that. So um, as we think about what we want to do going forward, we're really, I think, starting to think about how can we take the stuff that did work and focus on that and maybe not worry so much about, you know, trying to achieve the full knowledge base vision right now. And so um, in terms of thinking about what we would do with new uh, development resources, we're really going back to our goal of solving problems across the supply chain. And what we're thinking about doing is building small focused applications built on existing GoKB data. So we do have actually a really good kind of seed data, especially when it comes to things like titles and organizations that we can work from. Um, we're really interested in using the Folio platform. So we, you know, being associated with Olay, have been following what's happening with EBSCO and Folio. And we're, we think this would be a great opportunity to test out the ability to use Folio as kind of an independent application developer, not necessarily involved in the EBSCO um, library service platform initiative, but kind of just developing other applications 
on the same platform that maybe could be used with EBSCO's product, be used with other Olay efforts, but sort of are coming out of GoKB. And we want to continue to engage all kinds of partners, so librarians who are interested in creating and contributing this data, but also other knowledge bases who might, you know, they might have a, a great process down for loading packages and doing the whole acquisition side of things, but maybe they wish they had better title history metadata and we could be a source of that data. So trying to pull in people across the supply chain. Um, and so we're looking at kind of a services model where we would build these small service applications uh, potentially on Folio, and each one would be kind of focused around a single aspect of GoKB's data. And I'll talk about some possible examples of this, but you know, um, you could think about the idea of title histories as one example. Maybe it's a little title history app. It's a dedicated virtual workspace where people can go to um, access queues of work that need to be done to help manage and assign that work, do the work. Um, really easy data chunks, um, maybe API access, so good ways for people to get the data out. And then anything, it's still the same data as the main knowledge base. So GoKB continues to exist. Um, there may be other efforts with the main knowledge base itself, but any changes that happen in this are really changes to the knowledge base. It's all kind of one data pool, it's just a different way to see and work with the data. And some ideas for potential applications of this model um, that I'll just share. One is publication data. So this is sort of taking that title history thing, um, maybe expanding it a little bit. And this is actually kind of what we do now anyway, but as people work through these titles, you know, documenting publication dates, title histories, open access status, maybe publisher information. Um, and that could be an application that's just completely devoted to this sort of publication data, creating it and making it available. And this is data that's out there, it's publicly available, but it's just not available in a really nice, structured, easy to consume way. And so I think that's something GoKB can provide that would be useful to a lot of different people in the community. Um, another potential application is title transfers across publishers, and we've had some very preliminary conversations with uh, Project Transfer about potentially working with them, you know, combining the idea of a transfer alerting service with some of the enhanced publication information that GoKB might be able to provide, and there's probably other features with a service like this that people would be really interested in. Uh, and then the last quick idea I'll just share is about um, tracking package identifiers. So we have heard a lot of feedback that, um, you know, it's hard to know um, between different knowledge bases which packages are really the same thing. You know, EBSCO might call a package one thing and then, you know, say they call their own package, EBSCO host Academic Search Premier a different knowledge base just calls it Academic Search Premier. But you know intellectually those are the same thing. So trying to bring that type of information together. So we've got a lot of package names already in GoKB. We could bring in more. You know, we can have a workspace where people can um, contribute identifiers from lots of different sources, collect variant names for packages, and sort of build a crosswalk between knowledge bases. And I think this could be done really easily without even worrying about what's in the package. I mean, that would be nice to know too, but as a starting point, it would be great just to know these two packages are the same thing, and then, you know, what's in them is an entirely different question. And again, there's probably other aspects of this type of service that people might be interested in. Um, so that's it for our prepared comments, um, but I did want to sort of see if anybody had feedback about, you know, what we're doing now or these ideas for potential new services. Is this something that people could see being useful? Is it something people would want to get involved in? What types of services do people need? What are the gaps in the supply chain that GoKB might be able to fill? So um, I definitely would be curious to hear what people have to say. Great, Kristen. This was nice to summarize uh, your looking forward here, and we got a, a question in that uh, could address some of this too. A group of libraries in BC might be interested in contributing to the development of services for GoGate. Go KB, including a link resolver, A to Z list, and ERM. Is there any possibility of working with the Folio Olay community to do this? Hmm. 
I mean, I think we would definitely be interested in talking with this group just to understand, you know, their goals and how we might fit in. Um, and I do think the model of GoKB being a potential knowledge base to support these types of services is out there. Um, there are a couple different groups who we've spoken to already. Um, one is TIND, and they are um, a group, they're based um, in Europe, and they're building uh, right now, they have a, an ILS, and they're building kind of an acquisitions and ERM component, and they're interested in using um, GoKB with that, we've also talked with a group in Germany. They have a project called Laser, which is another ERM development project, and they're interested in using GoKB as well. So I think there are some templates for that. Um, I do think, um, you know, there would be the question of who's actually doing the work to build these services. Up till now, it's really been a model where there's an external group. They already know they're going to build a service, and they're working with us to use GoKB's data as a part of that service. So that's a model that probably would work. If it, we wanted to think about a different model, that would probably be something that needed a lot more discussion. Great. My follow-up question on that, Kristen, how many, do you have any idea how many people are using an API or coming in and pulling um, data from GoKB at all, your open data? Um, I think right now we have about, we have three groups who are doing this on a test basis. I don't, at the moment, we don't have anyone who is using the API or the service in a production environment, but we've got a few groups who are in the process of developing something and are experimenting with our APIs. Okay. Um, and I encourage people, uh, we still have time, so please uh, answer, uh, enter your questions, because I, I have still more to ask here, too, but please enter your questions. Um, one of my other questions, when you mentioned, Kristen, about an OA application, the open access status of uh, materials, uh, that is exciting. Um, I think it would be really nice to have that as part of the kind of enhanced data. Uh, are you thinking of doing that anytime soon, or how would you get started on something like that? I think that's something that's definitely on our radar, and I mean, we've had many, many discussions about ways of pulling additional op data about open access information into GoKB. Right now, we already actually have on our title records an open access status where we can code things as either being fully open or hybrid or delayed or not open. Um, and as, actually, as people are doing the title history work, it's often, you know, they're already at the publisher site, they're seeing this kind of information, and so they are populating that as well. Occasionally, we can populate that through our ingest process, too, um, if pu some publishers will include that information in, like, their KBART files, and we can bring it in. Um, I think there's other ideas we've had for, you know, places like uh, DOAJ has an API where you can pull in more um, detailed open access information and there's other things out there. Um, and that would, you know, it just would involve for us a lot more development work in terms of like bringing in data and having new fields for everything. But if there was something that there was really a lot of community interest in, I'd be really curious to know like what, what types of open access information do people need? Would they like to see in a service? And I, I could see that being a direction that we would go in. Right, absolutely. Yeah, that's great. Um, I'll, I just got another question. Is there a link for the metadata uh, available via the API? Is there a link to the API? Is that on your website to, to get more information about the API or metadata? Um, I think it is. Jennifer, do you, or do you know? Um, I think if you want access to the API, um, you just need to contact one of us and we can give you permissions for that. It's not, you can't register yourself. Um, so you would need to register for an account and then we just change your permission levels. Yeah, but that would be um, actually one of the things we have been 
wanting to do for our website that we hopefully will get up and running soon is to do kind of like a for developers page where we could actually list out like here's how you get the API, here's how you do um, the different like more developer things. But yeah, um, if you want to email Jennifer, she can get you set up with the API access. Um, and I saw someone also asked about the URL for the Sparkle endpoint. And um, we should make sure that's on our website too. There's still a few bugs being worked out with the Sparkle endpoint, but if there's somebody, if um, like the person who asked this question, if you're interested in playing around with it, we would be happy to share the URL with you um, just with some caveats that there's a few things that might not be exactly right yet. Great, thank you, Kristen. Um, another question, that came up is the data uh, quality is always an issue in a shared um, open data environment. And I noticed um, in the database there's a lot of um, points where you put in your name of who updated and the, when the date that it was updated. Do you have any concerns as your volunteer pool grows about um, data quality or any ideas on that? Do you want me to talk about this, Kristen? Sure. Um, <clears throat> well, for things like title histories and review tasks, and especially for the package ingest process, our volunteers do all get some training um, with me and they ask a lot of follow-up questions. So I do hear from our volunteers quite frequently um, I would say that as a community aspect, um, we do want it to be open, and if people are making changes that seem like they're, I, this has not happened, but if they were just making changes to cause problems, then we would not want to support that. But in general, I think that um, this is a trusted group. Most people are very active in their own libraries and in the library community, or they are representatives of vendors. So they have a reason to make this good quality data. There's no reason that people should be doing shoddy work. And since it's a volunteer process, hopefully that this is, you know, um, work that they find valuable for the community and for themselves, and it wouldn't really serve anyone to be putting in poor quality data. That said, I mean, we do look at the packages and the titles as we're going through our own work. Um, <clears throat> so if there seems like there are things that are just wrong, then we will hopefully um, either I'll catch them or other community members will catch them. So mm -hmm. I think the, the, the level of trust there is pretty high. Right, and, and I think um, I was, also wanting to know if down the road there'd be a review process of, say, a trusted partner just is a little unsure about something that they could just slip that into review of the community. And that's kind of a nice power of the community to look at um, something that maybe someone has another source of data that they didn't or something. That's a great idea. I mean, I think there's definitely, you know, as we've been through this project, we've thought of many more things we could do to kind of make a more sophisticated structure for things like catching errors, reporting problems, pulling out things where you want more feedback. Um, and we definitely would love to do more of that. Um, you know, I think as, as the project grows, if we do continue to get a larger community and more people working on it, more resources, that might be something that we do need to think about doing more of. And and that is your power here of enhancing data and having the power of the community behind you. So that's, that's a really nice um, aspect of GoKB. Another question rolled in while I was talking. Uh, uh, what is the relationship of GoKB and KB Plus? How are they linked? 
Yeah, I can talk a little bit about that. Um, JISC and KB Plus had been one of our project partners from the start of GoKB. And we also use the same development firm called Knowledge Integration that's based in the UK, developed both KB Plus and GoKB. So the data models are actually really similar and designed from the start to be compatible. Um, right now, KB Plus is actually a separate service. And so for anyone who's not familiar with KB Plus, it's um, most, I guess, primarily an ERM service that is run out of JISC in the UK. And their mission is to support UK universities, especially in managing consortial packages that are often licensed at the national level. And so part of KB Plus is a kind of a, a knowledge base that's a very specialized knowledge base that really focuses a lot on these UK consortial packages and then also uh, focuses on some other non-consortial packages that are known to be of interest to kind of the core GIF constituency. And I think they have like 2.5 uh, FTE of data managers who manage this knowledge base. So they're not trying to be comprehensive. Uh, they're really focusing on what's important to their community. And then the KB Plus service uses that knowledge base data to um, offer some ERM functionality, so subscription management, licensing, um, a little bit of financial management, uh, managing, you know, sort of administrative information, all that kind of thing, um, and specifically scoped towards that collection. Um, there was kind of a thought at the beginning of both of these projects that eventually KB Plus might transition to using the GoKB knowledge base. Um, instead of using kind of a separate KB Plus knowledge base. And that hasn't happened yet. Um, I think it's something that, you know, we still are thinking about and discussing. Um, but KB Plus, especially as a, a service that's up and running and that is really successful and relied on by a lot of customers, it's kind of a disruptive process to make that switch. So I think we're still, you know, we never quite figured out how to do that really seamlessly. Um, but our Ian Ibbotson, who's our developer for GoKB, um, has piloted a, an integration of the GoKB knowledge base with KB Plus that uh, works really well. And so even though this hasn't been implemented by KB Plus, it's, I think, proved to be really useful. Um, we're, we've been sp talking with, um, as I mentioned, a group in Germany who is building their own ERM for consortial use. And they're actually taking KB Plus as a starting point for this ERM, and they want to use the GoKB metadata as well. So the work that's been done to actually to, um, integrate KB Plus and GoKB, I think is going to see some new life um, with this particular project. And if anyone from LASER is here, I hope that I've represented your project correctly. I think it's a really interesting one, so I'm really um, eager to see what happens with that. Oh, that's so exciting to hear, Kristen, because it's so nice to see how this work can build off and um, go in different directions with um, all that you've done. That's great. So we have another question. Uh, there was a mention of ebooks functionality um, and having uh, ebook packages. Are there more details about um, the timing of getting more ebooks into GoKB or what what's what the status is? Sure. So we are actually kind of finishing up that work. And so just to, I guess, be a little transparent about what's going on with our development process right now, um, we had a final release that we were finishing up in the spring, and that got derailed by a couple things. So um, by some internal technical problems and then by um, a big server migration that we had to do. So while most of the work for that release is actually complete, we're sort of trying to clean up from all this technical disruption before we push that out um, publicly. Uh, but that should hopefully be happening within the next month or so. And so uh, the eBooks functionality will be a part of that. And the eBooks um, process for ingesting the data actually uses a different tool. So it doesn't use our open refine tool that we use for journals. Um, it uses kind of a a, a loader that really can handle a lot more um, volume since ebook collections tend to be so large. And so um, we'll really need to work on kind of piloting 
the use of that tool since it's still new and we haven't really ironed out all those details. So I think within the next few months, I'm hoping that we can start to at least bring in one or two ebook collections as a pilot. Um, but we also have to look at, you know, how frequently do we have to load this data? What, what kind of work is involved with that? Um, but one thing that will be happening, um, hopefully in uh, early to mid-September, is that um, David Kay, who has been our development manager for the project uh, since the beginning and is also very involved with JISC and a number of projects going on there, has really been working with a lot of institutions in the UK to kind of understand what are their needs around ebook management and um, how can GoKB address some of those. And so um, David and Ian, our lead developer, are going to be doing a webinar kind of um, demonstrating here's what we've done with ebooks in GoKB, here's how it can be used, um, and kind of going through all that functionality. So we're hoping um, September we'll be able to do that, and so uh, we'll be sending out an, an invitation to that to our various listservs and communities, so uh, you could be on the lookout for that. That's wonderful. That's really wonderful, Kristen. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I think uh, those are the majority of the questions. Does anybody have a last question <laughs> they want to leave with Jennifer or Kristen before we um, sign off? Um, this was really exciting to hear about some of the new uh, transitions, what you're thinking about, what the resources could go towards, and um, I'm excited about some of your en enhanced data, I have to say, so. Thanks, Sharon. And also, I should mention, um, with, you know, GoKB being part of Olay now, we are planning to do, um, quarterly do one of these forums about GoKB. So, of uh, you know, a handful of times a year, we'll be giving updates and sharing our progress. So you should hear from us again in another few months. Great, great. Well, since I haven't seen any other questions come in, I really would like to take this time to thank Kristen and Jennifer for their thoughtful overview and um, thoughts about going forward and how to manage data. And I thank all the participants for your questions. That makes a more lively um, discussion. And our next forum will be in two weeks, August 24th at 11 um, a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And Philip Jacobson from the uh, Index Data will talk about the principles of user interface and user experience. He will give a little discussion about uh, framework for folio and how to apply these principles to um, basic circulation and user administration. So be looking for that registration information coming out very soon and thank you all for joining us today. Bye-bye. <laughs>